Hi guys, it's me again, and this video I want to talk about something which I'm not particularly an expert in, but it's something I've come across recently and spent some time trying to understand and learn, so I thought I might as well make a quick video, or it might probably be about 30 minutes, I would imagine, just to go through what open badges are and why you might want to use them. So just a couple of things, the URL there for openbadges.org is there. I do not work for Mozilla, I do not work for Open Badges, so I'm just a, a kind of an interested party. So this isn't an official video. But if you want to know more details, frequently asked questions, guides, all kinds of stuff, then go to openbadges.org. So first off, what, what are we trying to do with an Open Badge? Well, kind of the starting point is we want some kind of verifiable assertion of someone's learning. So somebody has achieved a certain milestone, they've covered certain criteria, and because of that, an institution or an organization can assert that the user has received what's called a badge. Uh, another thing is that the system is designed to be portable and open. Obviously, it's called open badges. And again, that's important so that different organizations, different technology companies and stuff embrace the technology and spend the time to kind of implement this. It's pretty simple and it really allows for people, whether you're an official awarding body like a school or a college or any kind of unofficial organization, you could be a charity, you could be some kind of education not for profit. You could be anybody and you can issue these badges. It doesn't cost you anything to do. And the three main people involved in this, IMS Global are an education company and they've kind of written the specs. They have their logo on them. Mozilla is kind of the public face of open badges, I guess, just because they're a lot more famous globally. And then LRNG or another organization that deal with learning and kind of creative ways of learning. So that's who's behind it, and really that, that first line is what we're trying to do, a verifiable assertion of someone's learning. So if you go to the specification, it's very easy to find under the developers section of the Open Badges site. A couple of things worth noting that the current specification is version 2.0, which is in final draft, and that means that it's unlikely to change very much before it gets formally approved. But like most of these specifications, they sometimes take a long time for all of the right people to get into the room in order to discuss and to sign that off. And although it's not completely backwards compatible with version 1.1, it's very, very similar. So if people are already using version 1 of Open Badges, they'll be able to update things fairly simply. And most of the tooling will work with version one badges, but there are a kind of couple of gotchas in there. So just need to watch out. And really all the specification is describing are a set of primarily JSON LD documents. So JSON with linked data is effectively just normal JSON format. So to look at it, it mostly looks like normal JSON, but it also has the ability a little bit like XML does with a schema to specify the context. So you'll see later an example where you have an assertion, it will have a parameter, an attribute that says the context of this assertion is open badges. So it allows tooling and stuff just to verify what's going on, just have that little bit of extra understanding and not just to get any old random JSON document and try and use it to the best of its ability. Another thing that JSON-LD provides is internationalization. So of course, for any true global standard, ideally it should support non-ASCII, non-English, non-Latin alphabets. So you'll find a lot of references to URI, Uniform Resource Identifier, in this presentation. Really the official definition in the specification for open badges is IRI, which is effectively an internationalized resource identifier. So it's exactly the same as a URI, but it doesn't just have to use the Latin alphabet. It could use Chinese or Arabic or whatever you, you like there. And just to be clear on what a URI is, most developers still find it quite confusing. URL, URI, URN, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. URI is really the most abstract, the top level entity, and effectively it is a resource identifier, and that's all it is. So a URL 
is a type of URI, a, a more specific one. And a URN is a type of URI. But a URI is really just a way of saying, I need a way of identifying a resource, ideally globally uniquely, but it kind of depends on the context of that, whether the identifiers are actually globally unique. But in most cases they are, which is quite handy because it allows me as an organization to generate my own URIs and to know that they won't conflict with someone else's URIs, either by using random number generators or, or whatever in order to make those numbers different. So URIs are kind of, kind of quite key here. You'll see them a lot, but we'll see that as we go through. Timestamps, there's a few places where we talk about timestamp. When does an assertion expire? When does something, um, what other timestamps have we got? When was it issued? When was the badge issued? That kind of stuff. They're in basically date time format, ISO 8601. So you can look that up or see the examples. It does allow extensions. So although specification defines in some ways the minimal set of functionality, it is possible to, to extend it. And I think part of the idea here is let's let the industry, the education industry worldwide, decide on additional things that might be useful and let them add them in without breaking the spec. So I'm not really going to talk about extensions at all, but just so you know, it is possible. The other thing I'm just going to mention in passing is that some of the places where a property is defined as text, it can optionally be marked down as well as just plain text. So that can be helpful for more kind of rich text generation. But again, once you get down to that level of detail, you can find that out in the spec yourselves. So we're going to work backwards here. And we're going to start with an assertion. Now, the assertion is kind of what we would call the badge. So the assertion is really the entity that says that this recipient has received this badge on this date. So you can see here, as I will do in all of these slides, the bold properties are the ones that are mandatory and the ones that are not bold are optional ones. So here on the right hand side, we have an example. This is just copied and pasted directly from the spec. So you can see here that in general, this looks like JSON. And the only difference is really you have these at context properties in there, which is still, uh, I believe they're valid JSON, but uh, I'm not actually sure about that. But this is the, the kind of the difference between this and normal JSON is we're giving here some kind of idea of like schema. What's going on here? What is this document? And here, for example, it says, well, this is open badges version two. And then you can see here all of these mandatory properties are specified here. I don't think any of these are in this example, but we will look at these individually. So the first off is most of most instances of any object that we create, including an assertion that somebody has been awarded a badge, is going to need some kind of unique identifier. And this is an example of a uniform resource name. So this is not a locator. This isn't something I can go out onto the Internet and find. But by using this format, I'm telling the system using this, that this is a globally unique identifier or universally unique, if you like that syntax. And so this is not going to match any other document, any other assertion that comes from anybody else, even if it's a different organization. The, the chances of generating two of these the same, even if using a random number generator, are basically it, you know, high, highly unlikely, so virtually impossible. So we have an ID he, here, and in this case, it could be a URN, and it could also be uh, an HTTP URL or an HTTPS URL uh, as another way. So you'll find a lot of these places where an ID can either be a, just a, a name like this or a URL, and we'll see those as we go through. The type, which you'll get in lots of these JSON documents, in this case would always be assertion. In some cases, these can be a couple of other values. Unless they're specified in the spec, I'm not going to mention that because most of those are special cases or edge cases. They're not common. So in general, when you see an assertion, you would expect type assertion. The recipient, which we'll look at next, is refers to another type of object. So that's the next thing we're going to look at. And then as well as the recipient, what badge is it that this recipient has been awarded? And again, in this case, you'll see this URI slash badge class. And what that means is, in this case, this badge either has all of the information, like it's a document built into the assertion, 
or it could have a single ID like this and a URL and then that would allow whatever was checking this just to go and grab that URL in order to obtain this document. So you've got two options. You can embed it if that's easier. You could have a separate URL. I guess it kind of depends really on uh, the size of this information in here and whether you expect to have lots and lots of assertions that point to the same badge data, in which case it might be easier just to use a URI, but it, it does the same thing. Then the verification. So this is telling the end user or the, if you like, the person that you're showing this badge to is telling them how they can verify that this assertion is valid and we'll look at these later this one is hosted there's generally only two types then obviously an issued on timestamp doesn't really need much explanation when was this issued and then a number of optional pieces of data here so we can have a baked image we'll talk a little bit about image baking later but we can have an image url or a data uri if we want to embed it directly into the json probably a bit heavy but we could do and then evidence optional evidence to say well what is the evidence that this recipient got this badge so there might be a list of oh there's there was a dissertation here's a link to the dissertation there was an exam result here's, here's a link to that so you can have a number of evidences you can have some narrative and narratives usually just free format text if it expires, when it expires, whether this assertion is revoked. Now, obviously, when this is first created, the assumption is it's not revoked. So if you don't include that, it will default to false, as you would expect. But if this was included and set to true, that would mean that this assertion has been revoked for some reason. If you want to, you can fill in the reason here. So you could say it's been revoked because of a you know a system hack or the the person was kicked out of college or something like that. So this is really what we want to get to. If we can work out how to populate all these pieces of data, then we'll be able to get our assertion. That assertion is basically our badge. And that badge says that recipient, in this case, aliceexample.org, has received a badge called badge class name 3D print master. What is it for? 3D printing knowledge. Yeah. So this is what we want to end up with. So let's look at some of these objects. The identity object is fairly straightforward. On the example we saw above, it had type email and the identity was just a plain text email address. So that's one way of doing it. But in most cases, you're not going to want to expose that email address directly. It's considered at least semi-private information, certainly not generally publicly available so the recommended way of identifying somebody is to provide a hash of their email now the type here it says email pretty much that's what everyone supports there are a couple of others but in general for an individual email is the only supported type so you take the email you hash it using a method like SHA-256 with some salt some randomly generated salt and then in your identity document part of that JSON, you would put the salt value, base64 encoded. You would say true because it's hashed. You would say it's email. And then up here, you would have some data like in this example. SHA-256 shows how you hashed it. The dollar sign is a separator. And then the base64 encoded result of the hashing. But really all this is doing is providing a way that I can then take this and say, is this identity object for aliceexample.org? Well, if you tell me this is hashed and you tell me what the salt is, then I can also hash aliceexample.org with that salt and see if I get the same value. If I do, then I know that this is for aliceexample.org without Alice having to tell everybody what her email address is. So that's pretty straightforward. We go back to assertion again. We're now going to look at badge, the actual badge class. Now, what we've got to be careful of here is this idea that there's kind of, the reason it's called a badge class. If you're a developer, you'll know that there's a concept of a class and then multiple instances of that class. So an assertion really kind of uses the, the idea of an instance of a badge. So if this is an instance, what is the instance based on? Answer, it's based on the badge specified in the badge property. So we can see here, I've put it in bold if you can hopefully see it. This is the badge class and what's happened here is the document itself has been embedded in this assertion. As I said before, that ID could point to the this document instead, but it's all in here. 
So let's look at what's in a badge. So again, a badge has an ID. It's usually uh, an HTTP URL, which takes you to the information for that badge. In other words, it could be a page on your website that says, you know, badge one, two, three is the 3D printing badge or whatever. You could have the picture, you can have all of the stuff on there. But it doesn't have to be a URL. It could just be some kind of uniform resource identifier. The main thing is there's a way of identifying it. Again, we have a type field just set to badge class in this case. Name, description, just text. The image. Now, this is the generic image for the badge. This isn't the baked image that the end user gets. As I say, we'll talk about that later. But this might be a picture of, in this case, picture of a 3D printer or something. And obviously you can get somebody to make those for you or you can probably download them for free from somewhere. You then have this idea of criteria. So again, URI or an embedded criteria document. What is it that actually allows somebody to get the badge class? The criteria might be passes a written exam in 3D printing. It might be carries out a practical assessment. Whatever it is, they just get defined in criteria. And then the issuer it would normally tie to the same person as the issuer of this assertion. So when you see this and you see an ID, which will usually be uh, in this case here, if you look, the ID is actually a URL. So the issuer is implicitly example.org. So if we go uh, somewhere down here, yeah, example.org issuer. So usually those things tie up together. And again, it can either be URI, but if it, or if it's an embedded document like this one was, I believe it's an embedded document, then you need to make sure all of the right stuff required for profile is found in the embedded document. Otherwise, just point it to another URI. Very easy. And then alignment is something probably more useful for more formal institutions. So this could align to a curriculum. It could align to objectives for an accredited course so let's say you were doing learning towards maybe a you know level three electronics qualification you could say well in that qualification there are certain alignments and this aligns with that so again it's pretty loosely defined we'll look at those later but it could pretty much be anything but again just gives you that extra kind of understanding of what is the badge and what is the alignment and of course it could be more than one alignment it could align to different institutions different courses and stuff like that and then the tags are really just a, a simple way of, of tagging different badge classes may be useful for searching on badges but then they're not defined anywhere so if we go back to our assertion again and now look at the verification field now the verification is quite simple at the moment there could be more in the future but at the moment they're really just kind of three ways to verify something now in terms of the assertion itself these are the only two that mean anything. Uh, a hosted badge basically means you can find the badge at a URL. And because it exists at that URL, you know that that institution has issued it. That's basically the security. A signed badge is one where you use a JSON signed web token and using the public key, which you can get from the issuer, example.org, whatever, you can verify that that badge has been signed only by someone who has the private key, which implicitly is only the issuer. Verification object is another way of verifying items that are not to do with assertions. So if you, you were verifying something else, you could have that set to verification object. And that's the only one that's required. The others allow you to basically, well, verification property allows you to say which property are you going to verify. So if it was a hosted badge, you're saying, well, I'm verifying the ID property of the assertion. But in this case, there is actually only one value for that in most cases, which is ID. And that's the default. So you don't need to set that. And then starts with an allowed origins allow you to say which URLs from the ID property are allowed to be verified by this object. So you might just have example.org and everything comes from that single URL, but you might have badges.example.org and education.example.org or something. You might have lots of sites that all work under the same kind of business umbrella. So you could have a single verification object that says, well, as long as it starts with, you know, example.org slash, then it's okay. Or you could say we're the allowed origin for this is either 
data.example.org or badges.example.org as long as it's got one of those two origins then that's uh, an okay verification and in the case of a signed badge by using the creator field which is only relevant for signed badges you can effectively say which signing key am i using for this signed badge so this is a signed badge and it's going to be key one two three and when it comes to verification, which we'll look at later, that allows us to say, ah, we need to use public key one, two, three in order to verify the badge. OK, soldiering on. We talked a little bit about images, about baked and, and unbaked images. So here, again, you've got this idea of either having a URI to an image or you can actually put the data URI directly in the JSON. Notice that in this case, this example doesn't have an image or even an image URL in there because it's an optional value anyway. The idea of a baked image is very simply that if I've got a picture for my badge class, let's say it was the picture of the 3D printer, but then I also have an assertion, which is all this information. If I put this information into the image, which we call baking, then all somebody has to do is host that image just by itself with nothing else. And then any tooling that recognizes that image or that knows that it's an open badge image can read the image contents, can find this block of assertion and can automatically validate the image without having to do anything particularly special. So when we bake an image, we literally put this into either a scalable vector graphics or a portable network graphics file because they both support extensions which allow you to embed text into the image. So that's pretty much all they do. We're not going to go into any more detail than that. There is a specification for it. It's about three pages long, so it's pretty easy to understand. But the image is optional, so you can just have an assertion. That's obviously less cool because one of the nice things is to be able to see uh, lots of lots of badges and it'd be nice to kind of have a have a page maybe on github or somewhere where you just kind of say these are the badges i've got from everywhere and then you can just point your prospective employers or educational establishments to that page and then they can verify all your badges and again some other things that are kind of self-explanatory evidence again is uh, optional but it's just the evidence that might or might not be relevant for this badge a narrative free format text again so we got a narrative there under the badge but same kind of idea expires timestamp if it's relevant might not be relevant but it might run out in two years or something if it's a first aid or whatever whether it's revoked and revocation reason we've already talked about that so let's carry on down so the if we specify image in terms of an actual embedded document rather than simple uri then we can add a caption and an author if we want. In most cases, probably we don't. And since the type has a default of schema image object, actually an image can just be a URL of an image. So I don't, we haven't got that here, I don't think, but it would look something like that. It would just kind of say image is blah. And then that would be something that the system can follow. Then we come to evidence. Not really much to say about this. There's not really anything particularly interesting here type evidence again a uri same old same old and a load of text things describing what the evidence is very free format nothing specified as to what needs to go in there depends on what you're doing and then criteria is a similar idea what is the criteria for passing this badge criteria might be pass a test sit an exam etc so again type equals criteria that's it by default the id will be some kind of usually a readable page on the internet somewhere and again it can have a one line of description which might just make it easier to use in the json document without having to visit the links but id and narrative um, are optional and type is criteria by default but so let's go back to our assertion again. And now I want to look down here at the reason I've taken off the assertion stuff is let's look at the issuer because the issuer here is of type profile. And in the case of an assertion, profile contains a few more mandatory properties than if a profile is used for things like the author of an image or the recipient of a badge. The recipient can be a person, but it can also be a profile. So if we look at the issuer here, and go down look at some more detail like i say it's of type profile so we've got an id again often going to be an, an http url but it doesn't have to be because uh, 
a resource identifier is always context dependent. You can't infer much from a resource identifier except that it identifies a resource somewhere somehow. The type would either be issuer or profile and the difference being if you're an issuer as I said before you have to have a couple more things set on it. So if you're an issuer you also have to set name, URL and email. If you're profile you only need ID and type. So we then have usual kind of stuff, name, URL, telephone description, uh, image gain, optional image of the, the issuer. It could be a corporate logo or whatever it is that's, you know, kind of fairly self-explanatory. Public key, which will refer to, again, some kind of cryptographic key, which we'll see later. This also has a verification object. So how do I know how to verify things? Well, I look at the issuer and if the issuer says I can do signed uh, badges, then the assertion also says I can do signed badges, then we're good. If this says I only do hosted badges and the assertion says signed badge, then there's a problem because something's not going to work. So the profile, the issuer profile uh, should really have something in there that tells you how to verify things. And then a revocation list. So that, that will be a URI that will be a document that is a revocation list of any assertions that have been revoked for any reason. And again, we'll see that in a minute. Alignment object, we already mentioned. Alignment object is aligning to external criteria, to things like uh, institutions and requirements to have your course certified and stuff like that. This follows a certain format, which is uh, something the, the designers of the spec have tried to do. They've tried to use existing schemas and stuff that are all already out there in the educational world about alignment objectives, hence the name target on the front of everything. But again, this is described in the spec. It's probably a little bit more kind of advanced than what you need to begin with. Uh, the revocation list is very straightforward. This will be a document that will come back from a revocation endpoint. It will come back as a JSON document like everything else saying type revocation list. It will have an IRA, which will probably be the URL you just got it from. It will then have an issuer which again will be the URL of the profile. Those two are optional, but it kind of makes sense to have them in there. It just gives you that extra ability to match things up, especially if the endpoint for the revocation list isn't at the same URL, isn't at the same origin as the issuer. You, then you probably should specify that. And then this has an array of revoked assertion. And the revoked assertion is really a subset of assertion so type is going to be assertion because it's really the same as the first page. And then ID is again a URI, which would be the URI of the original assertion that's now been revoked. If you've got an old version one assertion you're revoking, then you have to use UID because they used to have effectively a, a number. And so you have to use one of those, but not both. And then revoked, which will default to true in a revoked assertion list. Normally that would default to false in an assertion. And then if you want to, you can put in a revocation reason so that when somebody looks up the list, they find this, the assertion and goes, oh, this this person you know, left college before they finished the course or something. So we had to revoke previous badges. I don't know, something like that. And then the cryptographic key. So this is from the W3C web payments, something group security something or other yeah good old uh, web working groups but again the spec trying to use something that's fairly well defined in terms of standards so it's another json ld document type cryptographic key a uri which will usually be the url that will take you to the contents of the public key obviously not the private key and then an owner uri so ideally if you if this cryptographic key was owned by say example.org then this should have the URI of the profile for example.org and in the profile of example.org that should have a cryptographic key pointing back to this URI and then it just enables it to have kind of two-way verification. And then if you don't have an HTTP URL then you'll need the public key PEM contents which is base64 encoded public key and this is what you're going to use if you use the signed badges later on so you'll need to be able to access this somehow and then endorsements probably kind of the weirdest thing it's easy to understand what it is it's not easy to understand how it really fits in with the rest of the spec because it's only referenced in a shared property called version 
And the idea here is it's all very well as an institution if I issue, say, a badge. But how do the people looking at that badge know that that badge means anything? Because if they don't know who I am as an institution or as an organization, then they, even though they know I've made the claim, they don't know how valuable my claim is. So instead, what they can do is they can, or I can obtain an endorsement from, let's say, a well known body. So let's say Mozilla endorsed my organization for something, then that becomes an endorsement object. And then the body using my assertions can say, ah, he has an endorsement from Mozilla that, and I know who Mozilla are. Therefore, I trust the endorsement. Therefore, I trust my assertions. So that's kind of the, the intention of it. Like I say, it seems to be a little bit of an afterthought because it doesn't really explain how it connects in. And it actually even says in the spec that the trick is working out how to use it. But just in here for completeness. And there are two shared properties that can be used in any of the objects and they're optional in all of them. And that is a related field. So you can kind of say this is related to another object. So the example they give is you might have other language versions of the same assertion or whatever, same criteria, same endorsements or something. So you could use that. And then the version is just an ability to use versioning. Although version is the one thing that actually ties back to endorsement. So you could say at a later date, this badge class now has a new version which has an endorsement. But that's about as far as it goes. So they're kind of the entities. Hopefully most of them kind of made sense. If you just remember that what you're trying to get out the end of the tap is an assertion that somebody can use and show to somebody else and that that's verifiable then all of all the rest of it kind of comes back from that so validation validation is basically making sure that all of the objects that you've produced are, are um, valid and this is something that you would do as an issuer or as maybe as a somebody who's written an issuing system then you can run these as some kind of unit or integration tests just to make sure you've done it correctly. So this is kind of fairly straightforward. It doesn't look like it's massively deep or deeply thought out. But what happens here in terms of validation is you start with the assertion object. You work out that all of the links work, that everything will eventually return a 200 response on HTTP. So you're allowed to have redirects. You might have redirect from an old domain to a new domain. As long as eventually all the links that the validator follows come back with a 200 with the document it expects, then that's the first check. One of them is that anything that's linked anywhere, especially optional ones, like a revocation list is optional. If it is there, it obviously needs to link to a valid object. Then each object that you find is in a valid JSON LD document and contains all the required properties. So we talked about the required properties. Mostly they're static. Sometimes they depend on the type of objects you're creating. And then each object, kind of a schema check, really, each object contains values of the expected data type. So if this is supposed to be uh, an image, does it equate to a valid image type? So as in kind of JSON verification, I'm sure there are tools to do that for you. So this is this would be done by the companies issuing these or writing the systems that issue them. But also this would be something that a good system that wanted to verify these badges would also do just to make sure that they haven't got some badge that somebody's cobbled together but obviously that would depend on whether it comes from a trusted source or not some quick notes on implementing implementing a system like this so implementing it in terms of issuing badges this is not implementing a verification system so imagine we want a site that actually issues uh, open badges then the first thing is i mean it kind of goes without saying but we do sometimes rush it plan 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 think think ahead design think plan plan some more how many people do you expect to access this is this going to be a big system and a big deal needing a lot of computing power or is this something you can just knock up and throw on a raspberry pi now you're not going to necessarily know that in advance certainly not exactly but you would likely understand if you're going to issue 50 badges to 10,000 people a year that could be a lot of other bodies kind of querying these endpoints so you've got to kind of consider in terms of size and resources secondly how are you going to design and build this you can buy some off-the-shelf 
versions of this some of them open source some of them you can pay for and for some of you that will be the best option because then it just works as long as it fits in with your existing system but again how you can integrate this into something you already have that's good in some ways but actually maybe a separate api is better separate api means you can scale it separately can have a different uh, url so you can keep all of it in the in one place and manage it separately you might want to have one api to support the badges issued by five different organizations that all work together under a single name for instance or you know two university universities that are partners maybe they issue the same badges so they want a single api so you've got to th think of things like that how are you even going to integrate the data if you've got users and stuff like that how's how's that going to work how are you going to get all those across will there be any long-term domain name issues so this is quite a hard one to think of but let's say you just decide to use you know badges dot myuniversity.com and these things are then going to be baked into people's images what happens if in 10 years your university changes its name you kind of either need to have access to the old name so you can use 300 re redirects or you need to think of a much more generic name that doesn't have to change if the name of your institution changes so there might be some things around that who's going to administer it both in terms of the data who's going to be issuing badges or the rest of it how good is the system going to need to be for the type of people you expect to administer it is it just a developer in which case it can probably be very low level and rudimentary is it something that you're going to need to make really really super user friendly who's going to administer the development the code the updates the hosting all those kind of things because not doing it is better than doing it badly you, what the last thing you need is people trying to verify badges and your system doesn't work properly the redirects don't work a document goes down you know the kind of big 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 reasons to think of these things carefully and consider it before you go implementing it but in general you'll create data storage somewhere you might already have some you might not most cases the tables can follow the design in the spec so pretty much follow what we talked about in the earlier slides if you had foreign keys that can just tie things up uh, more correctly so that maybe avoid you accidentally having a link that's broken if you make sure that that link matches an item in another table so that can be pretty cool then of course you need to think about how you're going to populate all of this stuff you're going to need users where are you going to get user information from do you already have it if you do how are you going to access it but you'll also need badge classes so you're gonna to have to think about that how many badges do i do i create how many do i have for each subject for each individual is it is it okay for an individual to get 10 in a year or is that too many i don't want to be all having you know five thousand different badges that will never be awarded because nobody knows where they are so you got to kind of there's going to be some design work around that and obviously you're going to need the images themselves made and again you can go crazy and make them look really cool and spend some money and get some real nice design on it or you could have something much more basic but of course it's kind of cool to have a badge that represents the skill that the person's obtained sometimes with some kind of indicator of the level one two three four five or some other kind of indicator that says oh this is a gold silver bronze level award and if you google open badges on the image search you'll see examples of the kinds of things that people have used and then of course you have to go ahead build the site build the endpoints now for certain items of these they're not going to change once they're issued so the assertion is probably not going to change once it's been issued in which case make sure you use lots of caching both object caching and client caching just to make sure that everything's not hitting your server every single time the more public you can make that caching the more chance that public caches along the internet are going to cache this stuff as well especially if you expect lots of people to hit it there's this issue around the content type so there's this content type ld plus json i doubt it's massively well supported that's what it should be if it can't be that then next preferred is obviously application slash json otherwise if the client requests something that's neither of those it is okay to return you know xml or whatever if you can support it and then we talked about badge baking earlier the concept's relatively straightforward to code so it only supports those two image types png and svg and the, the badge baker like i say if you look at the spec 
it tells you it's pretty straightforward you'll find a little code utility to do it for you and then once that's done you're going to need to put those badges somewhere those baked images because obviously every single individual issue of a badge is going to have a separate image with different assertion baked into it so you need somewhere to store all those and ideally somewhere for them to be accessible from the web as well and then the assertion endpoints this is where people are going to come to check an assertion so if, if an assertion is revoked, you should really return a 410, which is gone. And as long as you return the ID and the revoked equals true properties, then the client's going to be able to interpret that appropriately. Otherwise, you return the JSON response looking like the example we saw right in the beginning, something like that for the specified assertion ID. And of course, it's up to you how you do that. There's going to be some kind of URL in the assertion ID that the some that the end user is going to come to in order to verify it so that obviously has to map onto the correct assertion the assertions themselves are not particularly private so you don't need or you're not going to be able to particularly make those numbers secret or anything like that anybody can come along and guess an id number so don't worry too much about that which that's just another reason why you should hash your uh, recipient identifiers rather than use plain text the revocation list endpoint, we talked about this earlier. So again, this is just going to be a JSON representation of a table of revoked assertions. Now, you might not be the kind of institution that ever revokes things, or it might be so rare that this is not really such a big deal, but you'd still need the revocation list endpoint available. It should still be the basic headers with then the array of the data table entries for the revoked assertions. And... Obviously, technically, what should happen is you add items to the table of revoked assertions or maybe mark the existing assertion as revoked. And then the endpoints should just work automatically. Be careful with this one. You don't want to cache it too much because you want people to find out about revoked credentials as kind of as soon as possible. But you'll just have to maybe make a call on that. Obviously, you can't force people to check the revocation list, but... They should be checking the main assertion endpoint and the main assertion endpoint should tell them that the thing is revoked. So in terms of verification steps, there's general verification that you would do. So this is now the end user. So let's say I've got a badge at college. I've now gone to an employer for a job and I've said I've got this badge in 3D printing and I got it at institution XYZ. So my employees are then going to say, well, I need to validate that that's true. I'm not just going to take your word for it. So they're going to basically ask me for some kind of way of getting to that assertion. So I could send them to a page with an image on it, which has the assertion baked into it. I might just have the URL and I just say, if you just go to this website and click on this link and search for my name, then it will come up with a little badge you can click on the badge the first thing that the software at my employer should do is perform data validation like we talked about before does everything link, link up correctly does it all make sense is all the correct types then you basically have to ask do the badges match the verification object specified by the issuer so i mentioned that earlier if the assertion badge says this is a hosted badge and the issuer says i only do sign badges then there's something gone wrong and you know you know, it's not going to work properly because the issue is going to want to do one thing and the badge is telling you to do something else. The other thing is make sure that the badge was awarded to the correct person. So it's, it's going to kind of say, well, which email address was this awarded to? And I'm going to say, oh, it's my Alice at example.org. So they can then do a process to make sure that this is definitely my, I'm definitely the recipient of this assertion. It's not for someone else. And it's for a, a valid property in other words email then make sure that the issue of the badge of the actual assertion badge is the issuer of the badge class so if we look back at that assertion right on the front page you'll notice that that's the assertion but that has a badge class which then describes the issuer so we want to make sure they're the same person because how could the assertion come from a different person, the person who issued the badge class unless there's something dodgy going on so that would be matched up Make sure the assertion is not expired if there is an expiry date. Make sure it's not been revoked. Make sure revoked is not present in the in the document or if it is that it's set to false. And then if there is some way of carrying out endorsement checks, which is not specified in the open badges spec, then that could be done. So they might say, well, we need a badge that's accredited by the institution of 3D printer manufacturers or something. 
And you could say, oh, yeah, it has been endorsed by that. But the mechanism to actually check that is not defined. You might have to go to a website and prove it. You might have to click through a certain link on the awarding college's website to say this is the, the endorsements we have for this badge. Might be on the, the badge class website. So kind of could be anywhere. And in terms of the hosted badge, like I said before, what we basically do here is you say, well, as long as I go to the URI of the ID of the assertion in my browser and it says this is mycollege.org, then I know that that has been issued by mycollege.org because I'm assuming that Alice doesn't have control of that domain to create her own assertions and to pretend that that they belong to her. So the hosted badge, the only security is that it's on that domain. So security is implied since the object comes from a domain that an attacker does not control. So www.college.com, assertions, whatever. So that's why you can't rely on a copy of the assertion, but you need to use the specified URL. So in that assertion, the very first ID is usually an HTTP URL rather than just going, well, yeah, this looks cool is you go to that URL, you make sure that you get the right document back, that it matches the one you've got a copy of and everything else matches up. And then you know that works. A couple of other little things in there, but you can read that later. Assigned badge is got slightly more work to do, but really all you're getting back with a signed badge is a JWS, which is a JSON web token, which is signed. So JWS, what you get back is a header and that will be the type of json web token there'll be a payload which will be a base 64 encoding of the assertion json and then there'll be a signature which is applied using a public key and a certain algorithm so the payload although it's base 64 encoded it is human readable so this is not encrypted it's just signed and this for the signature they recommend rsa sha256 just because very well supported everywhere others could be used but you probably get going a bit risky and RSA SHA-256 is pretty decent. Then you would need to issue a profile public key for verification of the signature. There could be more than one. The issuer can have more than one public key. So that was that creator property we saw earlier to say, ah, the verification for this assertion says I oh, need to use key one, two, three. Therefore, I'm going to go and get key one, two, three to verify that signature. And then you perform the basic JWS verification, which is base64 decode the payload to get a verifiable passable JSON document. Do the data validation again, like we did before. Verify the signature, but only with a key speci specified by the issuer profile. So again, we can't just, um, just blindly assume that what we've got to hand is correct. We might already have an assertion document but we can't assume that anything specified in there, especially if it's embedded in the document. We can't trust that. All we can trust is go to the issuer specified in the assertion, grab the public key from there and make sure that the signature matches. And that means that the item hasn't been tampered with. And it also proves that it's only been issued by the person with a public key with a private key who we assume is the issuer. And then you obviously check in the same way that the the document, the assertion has not been revoked. So that's kind of it, really. Um, I was going to say very quick. That's not massively quick. It's 50 minutes, quite a long introduction to open badges, hopefully giving you a little bit of an idea of what to do from a developer's point of view, giving you some ideas. There is some documentation on the web about for developers and for implementers and stuff like that. Be a little bit careful. I did find one document that was still linked that was based on version one. So that was very unhelpful because when you're new to this, you don't necessarily know what you're doing and you start following these instructions and then they don't work. So the version two spec is fairly short and easy to read. So that's always a good starting place if you're looking at it from a developer's point of view. Otherwise, plenty of frequently asked questions. How do I do this? Who else is doing it? How do I verify these badges, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So hopefully uh, that's enough for now. And any questions or comments, I may or may not be able to answer them. Please just chuck them in the comments box below.